48. Okay. Okay. All right then, welcome back to the fourth episode of Track Coach Clubhouse. Uh, with me, Andy Poppleton, I'm a sprint and hurdles coach from Tunbridge AC. And we've also got distance coach Mark Hookway and multi-events coach Lewis Church, also from Tunbridge. Today, the three of us are going to be discussing uh, coaching style, um, the way in which we coach, not necessarily our love of track suits. Um, obviously, it's all quite an intangible thing, what, what style is. So just to kind of frame the discussion around it and just have a sort of, bit of a starting point. Uh, did a little bit of research on what is sort of considered at an academic level kind of the three main coaching archetypes and those are autocratic coaching which is a kind of very drill sergeant my way or the highway kind of uh, approach uh, democratic coaching which is where a coach sort of sets a framework but it's sort of quite athlete led within that and the athletes have a big say in what it is that they're doing and then finally holistic coaching which essentially is all about creating uh, an environment. It's not a huge amount of structure. And it essentially works on the philosophy that a happy team is a successful team. Um, now, personally, I think that's a very general approach and um, it, it just lumps far too many things together. I think in reality, you get much more of a blend and there are other things that come into it. So I thought that's something that we could explore. Um, Lewis, let's kick off with you. How how would you describe your coaching style? Um, in with, with those three. Well, I, I think that's a, that's a useful starting point. But you know, building yeah. whatever else you you feel, what what defines how you are as as a coach and how you deliver sessions? Um, well, I'd say I, I talk to athletes a lot to begin with. So when we're planning uh, the overall program, and then when we're at the session, they're very authoritative. So the session is what the session is. We've all agreed on mm. the session beforehand. So there's no kind of deviation from it. Um, so I guess I'm a, probably a mix between the, do you say the democratic and the authoritarian one? Yeah. Yeah. And no, I think that, well, those are two of the, two of the sort of the, the categorizations that sort of come out in, in various studies. But um, yeah, so that, that's, that's interesting. You sort of saying, it's relatively similar to me actually. So, quite democratic and a lot of athlete involvement in determining what it is yeah. you're going to do in the first place but then you kind of hold them to account and, and crack the whip if needed during a session yeah, exactly you've got to you've almost got you've got to be the person they've got to be accountable to so I think you've got to be quite authoritative otherwise um, most things end up being conversation you don't get much achieved from conversation you get things achieved from actually being told what to do or doing them hmm that's what I tend to go for generally but yeah like I've said in the in the planning stage of uh, uh, the training programs um, I'm quite quite open to suggestion and I like conversation uh, to uh, get the best out of everyone yeah so just um, the benefit of those that don't see you down the track I mean you're, you're working with a relatively um, small group aren't you of, of athletes um, was it about 10 or so would you say Ten or overall, but I reckon it's only about five at a time, really. Yeah. Would you say, um, and it's probably where you can bring Mark in when he's working with much larger numbers. Do you think you'd be able to manage that, where um, where you had, say, I don't know, kind of forty spread out across a couple of different groups? Um, I'd probably have to change my approach to how I plan a lot more because I I wouldn't be able to cater for everyone's specific needs and make it bespoke for them. Mm. So I think um, the way I coach at the moment, I don't think I could do it for a larger group, especially being an athlete coach as well. It'd be, uh, I think it'd be quite a mammoth task mm. doing it for a group of, let's say, 20 or 30. It needs to be enough for almost one, one group running at a time. And another, well, most I probably do is about 12, so two sets of groups running, really. Mm. I couldn't do... Uh, I couldn't do a setup like yours, Andy, where you've got lots of individuals running uh, individually uh, because I just wouldn't have enough time in between my own training to get enough quality coaching in. And yeah. same with Mark, you've got such large groups that I just uh, well, I wouldn't be able to train doing the, the amount of athletes you are. Mm. So Mark, that kind of in a slightly lead stage. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so Mark, that kind of leads us in quite nicely. So I've, I've made the presumption there that you're not able to be <laughs> as democratic as Lewis. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> is, is that right? Um, well, uh, there's two sides of it, isn't there? There's the, or three if you like, there's communication before, after and during training sessions, you know. So uh, you, you t perhaps take a different approach at, at, different, at different times. I think, again, I'll remind everybody, I'm, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking about coaching, I'm talking about coaching over 18s in my case. That's the group now. That's the age group, although I've dealt with younger ones. Um, and still with a large group, whatever, whatever age, you're still managing. So you have to be quite autocratic. You can't, if somebody's mucking about, it's a distraction to everybody else. If somebody's talking when you're trying to explain what's going on, that's frustrating not only to you, you as the coach, but other people as well. So you have to have quite clear guidelines and what's expected. And people are looking to you to crack on with it. You know, imagine a cold winter night everyone's warmed up you're standing there to do some 800 meter or mile reps you've got four groups of 10 in each you don't want any dilly dallying around while they're getting freeze, freezing and um, frustrated so you've got to be on the ball in that respect but having said that um, you've got to sometime some at some point beforehand understand the other the softer side if you like the other skills where you try and identify who's had a bad day at work who's got stresses, who's feeling a little bit under the weather, who's probably overcooked it a couple of days before in training and all those sorts of things. So, or, you know, somebody's just worried about the session. So you've got to try and draw that out um, in, a, in a friendly way beforehand. But once everyone's declared, if you like, their situation and you're aware of it, then you, it's a case of cracking on. Um, having said that, during it, you have to have your wits about you. And that's why if you've got a big group, it's, it's good to work with one or two other. Uh, coaches or at least helpers or, or assistant coaches if you like um, to have time to keep the session running smoothly but cater for the individual situation because somebody might have a cough that tightens up or somebody might have overcooked a rep and got a bit too much lactic acid and about to throw up everywhere I might you know whatever it might be you've got you, you can't you can't just start the session with blinkers and just carry on regardless. Um, you've really got to uh, be able to manage those situations. So it, it, it requires a mix, but yeah, I, I think top, top line, you know, people in our group, they compete, they come along to, because they want to compete well. So you're there to do it properly and in a disciplined fashion. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that makes complete sense. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of commonality between all of us really on those in that um, I would say that um, with, with mine, I do encourage quite a bit of input um, from my athletes at, at various stages along it. But as you say, um, well, as both of you say, there are times when you need to be holding them to account on that and you can't just let them, um, you can't just let them dictate. Okay, I, I I don't want to do this now. I've I've I'm I'm just stopping just because. If if there is a a goal that you've all bought into in that session, um, unless there's a reason, as you were saying, Mark, where they've you know potentially they've overcooked it or potentially they you know you start to see they're carrying a niggle or something like that. Um, there are times you need to you need to hold them to account and say no. This is what we agreed we're going to do. You're going to do it. Yeah. Um, I think with me, I as as with you, Lewis, I do encourage quite a bit of feedback in terms of the the input but that's kind of within within a framework so i'll um when i'm this kind of goes back to bit when we're planning um talking about planning in a previous episode but um i'll know what i want to achieve within a session in terms of the what i'm trying to address whether it's i don't know maximum velocity or, or, or you know acceleration development or, or, or what it might whatever it, whatever it might be um but it might be when I'm actually writing the program in the first place, I'll, I'll re you know, reach out to some of the athletes and say, look, you know, what, what are you enjoying? What, are you, um, what do you like out of these sort of things? And, and what would you like to see more of in the next program? And just try and incorporate that. Um, so kind of getting the input there. And then there'll be times within sessions as well where particularly um, some of the older athletes that um, are a bit more experienced and have just gone through the uh, – 
gone through more training essentially and have, and have experienced more training they'll start to develop ideas of what they think they get the most out of so um within a session they might sort of say look could i alter it and do this um so i, I find that with hurdlers in particular a bit where if we're working on um and they say, say we're working on cadence in between it's well, obviously it's the sort of thing that i'd be looking for as well but they might actually volunteer it's like look i'm just not I don't feel I'm getting it at this spacing. Can I bring it in a bit more? And so, yeah, fine, crack on. Because that's um, it's like you were saying, Mark. Communication is really important, and we get we get feedback from what we're seeing, but it's the, the most obvious feedback is what the athletes actually tell us. Yeah. And if they're saying they think they need something, then um, then yeah, let, let's let's take that on board and let's let's address it. Mm-hmm. Would you say that, Mark? Would you say you've got uh, sort of a, a different approach now with that you're working with predominantly older ones than when they were younger well i'll give you an example fresh off the press if you like last night um i went to the track met um a few of the under 13s with with one of their lady coaches <clears throat> and um i won't name names or anything but it was quite amusing because that the lads had a, an idea they they were good actually. They they you know I asked them questions like we've got to split into two frees because of social distancing. How 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 do you think we should do that? And they they came up with the split based on you know their, their speeds and abilities. And all three all six were happy. Uh, so we agreed that we knew what the session was. I talked them through you know what recovery we were having and why we were having it. And but also said to them, do you think that's good? Do you think that work will work for you? And then, then I said to them after we'd done that, I said, "What sort of pace?" It was it was six hundred, four hundred, two hundred, uh, three sets. So quite quite a meaty session for under thirteens and well under under fifteen, some of them now. Um, and I I quizzed, <coughs> I quizzed them about what sort of pace they felt they should be go, going at. Um, so we had a little bit of debate about that and what to look for on the first set, and you know how to hold back a little bit and then we agreed i said to them right okay particularly at the in the current climate we've got to go in a train so we've got to maintain the social distance in mm-hmm. two meters who's going to lead the first one why are you going to do that so there was a lot of lot of um engagement from now that that's fine because there's only six lads you know on a club night there'd be 30 or 40 mm-hmm. and it would be completely different so you've got to raise your voice a bit more to get their attention um, and, and Julie, who I was with, made the observation, well, they're well, so well behaved um, with you there, Mark. But I don't know that it was that. I think it was just the numbers as mm. much as anything. And um, especially when we were doing a few drills and warm-up exercises beforehand, you know, it, some of them were quite sloppy. You know, they're, they're doing high knees and stuff like that. And it's, I said, what's the point in doing it if you're not going to do it properly? Now slow it down and, you know, take your time and concentrate and they immediately picked it up and did it um but in a big group you only need one or two not being that well this yeah. is much more difficult to control so i think you have to um adapt your style to the situation involved and you know we've spoken about it before if you know lewis in a small group if he has one that comes down is having a bad day and not really up for it and not looking for it. You've got to somehow deal with that and recognise it quickly, haven't you? Yeah. Um, would you also, Mark, cause obviously when you're, you probably change your style quite a lot training just a few people. Because I imagine when you've got 30 people warming up, you're not looking at their warm ups in particular, you're almost managing numbers. Whereas myself and Andy probably, uh, probably looking at specific details because we haven't got we've got a few enough athletes to actually speak to everyone. Yeah, it's, di- it's different, isn't it? It's dis- distance running rather than the, uh, so many technical events, of course. I mean, a lot of the time, I send out uh, quite a bit of information beforehand. Everyone's clear what the session's going to be. Um, and I check with them if they're going to be okay with that or whether we need to make some adjustments, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, you know, uh, that might mean encouraging them to do the full session or taking it on board, perhaps they had a rough one last time, we're going to make some you know, slight changes to build up their confidence. But a lot of the time, it's making sure everybody in the group 
whether they just nodded their head or not, really do know what what what's what lies ahead. And um, secondly, you know things like if they're going to um, want to put spikes on for the third set or something like that, that at least they've got the spike somewhere nearby and they're prepared to where they've thought through where the recovery is going to be when they're going to put the spikes on when you know when when they've got a chance to do it so it doesn't mess up the session when it gets to it so all these little things are going through your head to mm. make sure that the athletes have thought about it because a lot of the time they would just warm up and they won't even think ahead too much um it just adds to the smooth running of the session and reduces the frustrations with other people <laughs> yeah i think you've you've the nature of what you're doing on those club nights i think there's a much bigger um management task than either lewis or i face um I, th I think for, for me it's um so, say i've got uh i don't know so, say i want to have somebody long jumping uh you know as, as well then that's about the extent of it is like kind of just in terms of where we actually set up on track on the track or say there's a gale force wind going one way and i want to make sure make sure we're running with it rather than into it again just just turn them around that's pretty much the extent <laughs> that i need to worry about um about any of those sort of issues beforehand um so got it quite easy on that front i think <laughs> but um you must have situations where you've got a whole mix of characters just like you were talking about uh different personalities with coaches all the athletes have different personalities and if somebody says one person says i'm struggling tonight the, it, the words are the same but it can make, mean completely different mm. to different people uh, and it could mean to one person who's a genuine, real hard worker, grafter, you know they would never ever get, give up unless they really had, had to. They're in big trouble. Or it could be somebody who does it pretty much every session because they, they're just crying out for a little word of encouragement to say, come on, you can do it. Let's finish it off. Keep it going. Um, or, you know, it's all sorts of, we're all speaking the same language, but there's different interpretations of the same words, isn't there? Yeah, I think that knowing the athletes is key. I actually had an interesting example of that, actually. Of, uh, I, don't, I, I no longer coach, actually. He's, he's, he's moved to another coach. Um, but he was a real hypochondriac with injury issues, and, and he was always convinced that he felt a niggle somewhere and something was about to go. And I remember when I sort of met with this coach, I was sort of saying, you know, just, just sort of, you know, background on him and just sort of my experiences and, 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 and things to bear in mind. It's like, that's the case. But if it's ever anything to do with, like, hip flexors, then then you need to listen because that, that he has a genuine problem area. But if he's telling you, but he's just like, Oh, I think I might feel something in my calf. Nine times out of 10, it's not going to be anything. So you could probably run another rep and see if it goes away and it probably will. Um, so. That's the bit I can't get my head around with you, with you two guys. Um, I hear people say that one of your top athletes had a tight hamstring, Andy. Now, if, if one of the distance runner in, in, that, in my group had a tight hamstring, I'd be paranoid about them going at you know, 200 metres at any sort of pace. Whereas you, you've got the confidence to, to know that what they can handle it and crack on and do some quite intense work, sprint work. I, I think it's slightly different for that though, isn't it? Because if, um, especially if someone's got tight housing in your sessions, Mark, it's normally been going on throughout the whole session, getting worse and worse. Whereas the sprinters, it's almost, oh well, I know if I start sessions, I sometimes think well, my hamstring's a little bit sore. But like Andy said, I know they'll uh, warm up more as you go on. Whereas if I'm doing long distance and I get a hamstring niggle, I tend to stop a bit quicker because you know it's you're doing the same thing constantly and it's not going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's um, a lot of it is just, is down to knowing the athletes and um, certainly athletes that I'm new to. Um, I'm I said my, my natural inclination is that should be pretty cautious, and if anything, I'd say my athletes tend to be undercooked rather than <laughs> overcooked. Um, but there, there are those that if um, if we know that you know it, it's been uh, something that um, has, has, has flared up previously and hasn't necessarily got any worse through training, and it's not getting any worse as you do it, it's just feeling a little bit tight. It doesn't. It never sort of progresses beyond that. Um, and especially if they tell me that you know well. If I, if I know, I don't know, it was two days after a deadlift session or something, 
and you kind of well maybe it's not surprising it's 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 a, it's a little bit sore and tight but you know it's it's not getting any worse through the running mm. then um then it, it probably is something that you can kind of that you can work with um but it's something that i'll be having that dialogue throughout and, and working quite closely with the athletes during the session to see if it's getting any worse i, I imagine they probably get a bit irritated with me sometimes where I kind of after every rep it's like feel the same <laughs> any better any worse <laughs> and, uh, feel like they're being grilled a bit sometimes I think but um yeah it, it's it, like I say, it's, it's just a case of getting to know them yeah uh, Lewis I think it's obviously sort of relatively early days on your, your sort of coaching journey um and you've already touched on already the whole kind of athlete coach balance and you're doing a yeah. bit of both Without sort of wanting to wish for the next 10, 15 years away, how do you think you would, how do you think you're like, you'll be doing things differently or would be doing things differently if you were just a coach? Um, I think, well, the main thing would be numbers. I could, if I wasn't running myself, I could give the same attention to the five or six that turn up for maybe say 10 or 12. Mm. Um, so I mag- imagine I would try keep the the coaching the same almost i just uh i think i spend a bit more time of actually looking at technique when we're running because obviously i i don't get to see that if i'm running with the group unless they're miles in front of me and then so i i think i'd be spending more time on the technical analysis of the actual running whereas at the moment i'm kind of just doing technical analysis of the uh Lewis is frozen. <laughs> okay. No, I think it's, um, it's an interesting point for him on which you can freeze actually. There's actually something I was, I was randomly thinking about the other day about, you know, with um, Lewis's squad in that it does, obviously gets to be very technical on all the throw side of things and, and give a lot of, you know, he's watching them one-to-one on, on that. But yeah, the, the running where he's running alongside them, um, much more challenging for him to, to give input on that, so it's uh... yeah. I, I mean, it was a big, it was a big change for me when I, I used to run with them, <clears throat> and if you're doing like hill sessions and things like that, you're in amongst them. But if you're um, actually doing a, a rep session or a run, you pretty much only got the ones around you to look at and talk to and encourage, etc. So you're limited in what you can do. Um, and everyone said, you know, there was, I can remember people saying, oh, it's not quite the same when you can't run with them, is it? I said, well, actually, I see a lot more, you know, even on a bike, you can see the whole group. You can have a quick word with them. Anyone's dropped off the pace, check they're okay. Anyone's gone a bit too quick, just catch up with them and just say, hang on a second, cool it. Um, all these sorts of things. And, um, yeah, and when, you, when you're actually organising the session, you can see so much. You can see body language counts for so much, doesn't it? You know, if you, mm. you observe, you can see who's just looking. Even, not, even when they're actually doing a rep or whatever, you can see those that are just overdoing it a little bit. I mean, that, that's, I'm talking about distance running. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a huge amount of information you're taking in um, during the course of a, uh, a session with a big group if you're observing it which you couldn't do if you were actually running in it your, yourself um so, yeah because yeah. so i'll have to do all of my analysis by effectively verbal communication after a rep yeah, and uh, you got just short body rep. language or, or the stopwatch i don't get to see the actual run itself see how it's deteriorating or if it's uh, looking really easy but generally, you've got shorter reps and longer recovery, so that changes the, the makeup, doesn't it? it? Gives you a, a different opportunity to have that communication than distance running, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, I think in terms of the so going back a bit to the sort of changing over time. So I I, I started out doing bits of training alongside. So I kind of um, and I I found exactly the same thing. And early on, when I was still sort of trying to do bits myself. Um, I wasn't able to yeah, give, give the same level of detail to the bits I was running with them. Now, um, in my early days, I was doing 
a lot of it was, it was mainly hurdlers so those bits um i got to i got to um give the input as i would would do now um but when i was sort of joining in on the the running bits which was um tended to be the sort of slightly longer stuff anyway um by which I mean 150 meters, nothing you were, <laughs> nothing you were considered long mark. Um, but um, it's when I was sort of do, doing that, yeah. I, I all the only input I really, the, the only feedback I really got was, as you were saying, Lewis, sort of the the stopwatch or um, the the reports or the commentary from from the athletes. But I'd, I'd say that that change. It's in in a way I think whilst the opportunity to give feedback uh, to, to, to give technical analysis has increased um i'd say my own from my, my own sort of style has probably become slightly more restrained in um in the amount of not necessarily the amount of analysis i'm doing but the amount of feedback i'm giving i think early on i think it was possibly a case of me just being a bit overexcited <laughs> and and wanting to um wanting to intervene too much and, and, and wanting to change things. I'd, I'd see this, that, and that, and, and I'd want to try and um, fix all these sort of technical issues that I was seeing. Um, and I sort of go at it a bit too much. And I mean, I, I remember probably one of the, I still kick myself now. It, it's got, it must be a good 10, well, eight, 10 years on now. Um, but I think back to one particular instance where um, in the Midlands, I used to do these, these, um, races in the high performance center on the indoor season uh, just 60 meter races where you'd run one you'd have two hours and you'd run another um and i remember um a, a girl i was coaching at the time she ran a, a really good uh, first hurdles race um ran a you know pretty sizable pb i'd been videoing it i think by the time she'd got back to the seat i'd already gone through the video several times decided on the bits that i thought we needed to work on for the second race and um i mean don't get me wrong there was an initial well done but i very quickly went into bombarding her with all these things that i wanted to work on for the second mm -hmm. round and it's um afterwards it was a, a mum actually sort of approached me and sort of said look just so you know she kind of really demoralizing that she just run a big pb and kind of you know 95 percent of what you said to her was all the things she needed to work on um, I mean, you should say that andy because um just so, sorry, a couple of things there. One is, um, yeah, I think the emotions straight after an event are very difficult, I find, to talk about because they know whether it's good or bad. I mean, if it's good, give them a you know, good, good pat on the back and say, really well done. But if it's bad, I don't think it helps too much jumping in, I, I feel. Uh, and I prefer to leave it uh, 24 hours or whatever and just say, what did you think of this, that? But the other, the other aspect, um, which I don't know if you're going to touch on, is the difference between uh, male and females in that respect, in how you deliver some information and how it's received. And um, something we've thought about an awful lot over the years. And even within, of course, that's a very much of a generalisation because not all males think in the same way and not all females think in the same way. And you get a crossover in the, the type of personalities. Um, but I think very very simplistic and gen uh, and being generalizing i can say something quite brutal to a guy or shake it off and what you know may even swear back at me or something like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> but with um, some of the girls they they definitely need a little bit more of a subtle um way of going about any improvement because they a lot of work, a, a lot from our group in the years have found it very very you know, tougher in that respect you know same with that same not just with coaches to athlete but from their peers um girls are much more team players if you like huddle around encourage each other or you know all, all in it together sort yeah. of thing. whereas if one of the lads says i'm not feeling very good tonight or whatever the others will probably just rip him apart and take the mickey out of him you know i'm ready to smash him in the next rep and that's, um, that's, that's how it is. See, within managing a group and coaching a group, you have to bear all that in mind. And then with the individuals as well, I think. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think giving, giving feedback, it's something that um, you, you need to learn how to do it well and how to not, um, 
not upset the apple cart in the process, <laughs> which, like I said, that, that, that instance for me was quite a, um, it was a steep learning curve from my sort of fairly early days of coaching. And I, I think what you sort of said there about sort of waiting, waiting 24 hours is, um, I think generally that's sort of a, a pretty good approach. And that's sort of what I sort of tend to do. Um, I think, again, you need to tailor it to the particular athletes. You get some that, um, that really want that input and say you've got rounds in a championship and they've run an okay run in the semi um, and they've got a final coming up. Sometimes they actually feel better hearing something that about you know, what they need to do for the final because they've got sort of something to focus on. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a general rule by the time you get into a championship, it's, I, I prefer not to be saying too much at all by that point because the, the work's already done and you, know, you just want to let them go out and let them loose really. Yeah, um, but but yeah, there's there's some athletes that that, that want it and, and feel better for it. So, um, so put this one out to both of you. Let's, uh, Lewis, let's go to you since you're since you, you're back after having dropped off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What sort of what sort of other styles and sort of coaching archetypes have you sort of come across in the past? And do you have any sort of what have you seen? You thought, oh, I, I, I think that's that's a really good way of doing it, or what have you seen on, on the flip side and saying, we're not, not so sure about that? Uh-huh. Well, it, it also it depends on the person that's delivering it. So I've seen quite a few people which are obviously very bossy and don't listen to other opinions. There's a lot of shouting, maybe some swearing in there as well. But so I've seen two or three people like that. And for one of the, I'm not going to name them, one of the three people have actually gone up, I'd really like to be in that training group. Yeah. Because you res- you respect their knowledge of the sport and you respect that they've got a philosophy in place. Whereas if you're if you're trying to be very bossy and controlling with not a specific philosophy in place or a, a set plan, then you're effectively is it, I, the blind leading the blind almost. So, and the same again with uh, people that uh, uh, like uh, the holistic approach. If some some coaches that, if it's, I think as long as you've got a philosophy, and you I can respect what you're doing, you can explain what you're doing. Uh, any coaching style is fine because most of it should be coming like, intrinsically anyway. Should be motivating yourself. Um, it, I find it quite difficult to answer because from my perspective as an athlete, I'd probably prefer a, a quite authoritative approach. So I know everyone's on the same page and everyone's going to do what they're told almost. Uh, but I think many people would probably prefer a, a happy team, if I'm honest. Hmm. I, well, I find it difficult to answer that one. They keep coming back though, don't they? They're very loyal to you, Lewis. They keep coming back. You, I haven't heard any of them revolting as such. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, we... Well, at the start of the year, I always make sure everyone's, we're all on the same page, we're good friends anyway, but when we're at the track, it's serious, if you see what I mean. You've got to, as soon as you get to the start line, everything's serious, there's no joking around. Yeah. But, um, if I was an athlete being coached by someone, I don't know, I'd have to have a respect for that person and understand what they're trying to achieve before making an assumption. Yeah. I think, if, I, tangent, I think if they if they felt that you were just using them as cannon fodder for your own training and um, you weren't interested in them particularly and you just wanted a good organised session with some training partners, you'd soon be sussed. Oh no, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you look at it like that, because obviously, obviously, I'm trying to get better myself, but I'm not I'm not using people to get myself better. No, I'm trying to make us all all of us improve and. I'd say we've got all of us have got slightly different things to work on. We've got to try and work out what the happy medium is for all of us, really. Sometimes we're doing sessions which aren't particularly beneficial for me. And sometimes we're doing sessions which aren't particularly beneficial for someone like, let's say, Alex or Jess. But we're trying to all muck in together so we can run with people and enjoy the session mm-hmm. and get the most out of it. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult, especially being an athlete. People might uh, think I'm in it for myself. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, one of the main reasons people want to train with a group 
is because they're they're social animals and they want to be part of something and so as the as as the coach who's leading that environment you want to put things in place that are going to make that possible rather than put them off <laughs> yeah yeah i think that also um it lends itself well to so in my training group if i turned up every session and said oh we're doing this today people would assume oh, that's what lewis wants to do today yeah. whereas i i give out my yearly i give out the 20 week plan and then i give out what we're doing over two weeks so on the monday we get a two week training box you've got absolutely everything in it so everyone knows that that they're the sessions and obviously then if you turn up and go oh i'm not feeling that then that person goes off and does something slightly different but the set plan is there yeah so it doesn't doesn't come across that it's been set up for me for people to just join in it's set up for the group to uh to get as much out of it as possible yeah yeah and i, and I i feel that with our group we've got everybody from 20 minutes for a part run to a 147 800 meter runner you know so it's um everybody's got their own bit to get out get out of it wherever their speciality is whether it's 5k 10k half marathon or 800 meters so you've got to cater for everybody and you can't just do the same thing with everybody and hope for the best you've got yeah. to tailor it to what they're aiming at yeah yeah i, I think it's um interesting lewis when you're talking about the kind of the um those uh those coaches that you're saying are kind of the real authoritarian are kind of like, i was sort of think of them as like the drill sergeants and i think of like the full metal jacket <laughs> yeah <laughs> you've got someone in, in your face screaming um i don't think i've seen it quite that extreme but that's no, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that, that's that's the picture i have in my head with, with um and i think i have i've come across that um a few times and i think personally when i see it i personally i really don't like it um and I think I would hate to work in that environment. Um, but what I do find really interesting is within those groups, you often find some really, really fierce loyalty from the athletes to the coach, um, which I'll be honest, I find peculiar. <laughs> I don't really understand it. Um, but I, th I think it, it, um, it does sort of, sort of foster quite a lot of respect amongst some people i think it's probably really um you've got to have the two sort of right pieces of the jigsaw in terms of the athlete and the coach for that to work so i think there's a lot of athletes that would be put off by that um and i am certainly aware of a few athletes that, that have ended up sort of essentially leaving the sport because they're in an environment where the only coach that was really an option for them behaved that way and and, and they just didn't want to be there um, which I think is very sad, um, but yeah, at the same time, you've got to recognise there are there were others within those groups that kind of really adored the coach for it um, for some reason that I don't like. I say I don't really understand, <laughs> but um, I think that must come come down to because I, I know exactly what you mean. But I think it's if you if you're believing in a process and someone's your coach being so authoritative, you've you've got to respect what they're saying. You've got to be loyal to them otherwise if you're constantly questioning the sessions and obviously they're not going to budge then yeah. it's not going to work at all is it so i think uh i imagine it stems from that thinking right i really trust what he's saying i'm just going to go with absolutely anything without questioning it really yeah. and that probably yeah that, that's, that's probably right and that's um probably why it wouldn't have suited me either as an athlete or would suit me as a coach now because i think I, as an athlete, I was always very curious in why we were doing things and wanting to understand yeah. it and wanting to learn about it. So, um, and you know, luckily I had a coach at the time who, um, I think you know, he, he, you know, by, he was a teacher by, by profession. And I think it's, that kind of came across into his, into his coaching style in that you know, he, he wanted to, it's that old saying of like kind of a, a good coach that makes themselves redundant in, in their, kind of their passing on that, that knowledge to the athletes. Um, and I think that's the approach I've sort of taken with my own coaching as well. Um, I think it probably lends itself as well to the fact that I'm quite a um, quite a technically minded coach. Um, 
I did actually sort of message the group yesterday and sort of say, you know, what, what few buzzwords? What would you, what would you say about me and my style? And and uh, yeah, uh, technical focus was one of the things that sort of came in. I don't think that would necessarily work if you're if you've got somebody that every time they make a technical error, if if, if you're getting up in their face screaming, <laughs> or well, that's maybe taking it a bit too extreme. But if if you're coming down really hard and being really authoritarian on technical points. I think that's just going to be emotionally exhausting, um, both for the coach and the and the athlete, sort of trying to deal with that. Whereas, if it's much more of a, a sort of gentle process that you know you kind of you're working towards sort of constant improvement rather than just of why are you not perfect. Um, I think that's it, it, the, the the style in terms of the delivery goes with the style of the um, of, of the analysis of the session. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think, I think um, you've made me made me think there about something we we debate. Um, you take what take athlete A. You've got a plan for him. You you believe in what he can do or she can do, and you, you go over it with them and say, right, okay, I believe you can run, yeah, you know, a four minute mile, or yeah, you know, and or they've said, oh, I'd like to run a four minute mile, so. And you go, yeah, I think, I think you can. I think you can, but we've got to work on these areas. Once you've done that and you've got that relationship and it's clear, you can be quite authoritarian. When he's complaining about doing a session because it's a bit hard or whatever, and you say, well, actually, you're the one who said you wanted to do the four-minute mile, so you're only going to get there by working in this way. Now, that's one, that's one end of it. Then you've got the other end where we've got people who come to the club who probably haven't even found their feet in the sport. They get really worried about competing, let alone on a track. You just want to really coax them along. You want them to be in, in the, you know, just enjoying it, meeting up with friends, making it to the senior level where they could then start to flourish or just be prepared for when they go to university, they can sign up for the club and be part of something straight, you know, that's going to make a, an impact on their university life. You know, so you've got that side where... Actually, like you say, and you don't want to put them off. And it's very difficult when you're running when you you you're running a group, and you've got a certain way of doing it to cater for both both types. And it's something we're we're debating, and we have done before, really, about creating an environment in a different type of group, which is very very easier going, if you like, in terms of ambition. Um, but it's more about enjoyment, engagement etc rather than hard and fast achievement and um it's, it's, it's it, but the trouble is with that it needs a completely completely different coaching approach um the same coach can't do both um both logistically and personality you you can't do it on the same night i could do i could do the second one and i can do the first one but i'd have to do them on totally different occasions i couldn't do them both on a club night it'd be <laughs> it, it, do you see what I mean? And um, it's something I'm toying with. And again, it goes back particularly, certainly on the distance running at the club, we've had more success with the uh, male, male teams. We've had some great stuff with the, with the girls in recent times, but the depth isn't there in terms of the depth of top class, ambitious um, uh, performance type athletes. But there's some really keen ones that love the sport, love training, they compete for the club, but they haven't yet made that decision about their commitment level and, and what their targets are. And I think that's fine. So you've got, I think you need to be able to cater for that. And um, mm. so it's catering for both and doing them both a good service and justice and supporting them um, just requires a different thinking. Now, if, you, if you've got people who come down the club and want to do hurdling or sprinting, uh, and not that keen on setting big targets for the summer and stuff like that. That's uh, that requires a different approach because you want you want them to flip, and make the decision at some point. So you, in the back of your head, your your approach to them will be to get them there and eventually. But you've got to do it in a different way than somebody who's um, flag, flagged up their flag, got their flag uh, flagged up their ambitions to the mast and ready to roll. You know, it's. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that probably comes around to one of, sort of the challenges lots of clubs have is just uh, sort of the, the coaching numbers. And it's, um, I think it would be great to have different groups with different um, with different approaches. Or even if it is, is the same coach, if there was sort of just more more time available, which um, I think, you know, we're, uh, I mean, we're, we're all there at the track. I think, well, I'm, I'm three times a week. I think you guys are, some of you do, do you do more? I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but it's uh, you know there the are probably relatively few coaches that could commit more than that. So to to start adding other nights in to yeah. deliver the sort of the more recreational um, that sounds a horribly condescending way of putting it. But you know what I mean? The the the, the softer, more um, you know, in, in enjoyment rather than performance focused group. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be it'd be hard to fit that in. And to build and to build their confidence as well. Their confidence probably needs uh, more building and um, dealing with those aspects than the the others. You know, um, conf- well, no, they both have both will have confidence issues, but a different sort of requirement for confidence, if you like. Yeah, yeah. No, that that is that is chan- a, a real challenge actually, is developing confidence. It's, it's interesting actually. One of the um, uh, it's, it's a, a girl I coach who I've coached for years actually before I came to the club, um, and the on the female side, the group now has girls in it that are f- a, a lot quicker than the the group I had sort of previously, and um, that she was in previously. And I think it's been um, I think for her to not necessarily be ahead of those girls. I think it's kind of not to confidence a little bit until we actually sort of start breaking down the times and you say, okay, this is this is where you are compared to. Um, to what such and such from the previous group was doing when she looks at it now and she kind of thinks okay if we were back in the old group i'd be the fastest in the group now by some way i think that kind of that sort of built a confidence up a bit yeah. because um you know the way she, she looks at it and there's an under 15 beating her at the moment within the group but it's like kind of that under 15 is running stupidly fast <laughs> it's, but um it, it's the kind of the what has become the normal in the group is now so much higher than what she was used to yeah. It's uh, yeah, it it, it it can be a sort of challenge in perception of, of of how you're doing. I think that that sort of thing applies to us because uh, you know we might have say thirty people there at training. We're split into three or four groups, and they generally they fit quite nicely. But you'll always get some that fall in between, and then I have to be very conscious that where I can, I'll get somebody who's at the might be at the back of the first one group one time but then I want them at the front another time or I want to send some of those who are in the fourth group to feel part of it and leading yeah. and stuff like that so you can give them a shorter rep when the others are doing longer it, oh actually I can run as fast as them I just can't do it for quite as long at the moment and sort of build them up that way and um, yeah uh, You've got to be mm. however you do it you've got to be you've got to care about them, haven't you that's the end that's what we're talking about you know, yeah. e- even like you were saying the very authoritarian ones hopefully they care about the athletes and the athletes that you said um, you didn't understand quite well they went along with them <laughs> uh, that's 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 the bottom line that they realize that that coach does care about them um one way or another even though he's shouting or swearing at them all the time and that and that yeah you know, i've heard that happen quite you know quite frequently um but um, perhaps they know that they deserve it, and they're, they're um, <laughs> you know, they've got their they've got their their own what the, they want the best from them. And that's why they're doing it. Um, you know, um, I've ne- I've never I'm trying to think. Can't you know? If I ha- I've never sworn at them. Um, I, I've probably shouted at one or two over the years, and they just go <laughs> driving you crazy, and you just got to bring them up. A whistle's quite good, you know, but. Um, don't use that too often, but uh, yeah, sometimes you have to give them a shot out of the blue to. Yeah, I can't. I, I, I can't. I wouldn't want to say I've never sworn in front of them. I, I'm sure I have, um, but I, I can't remember um, ever swearing directly at them. Certainly not in 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 anger, as in like kind of a like I say, the drill sergeant type of way. That's just really not my way. How fair. If I have, it would have been done in much more of a sort of a, a flippant, jokey way. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, fab. But no, I think I think you're right, though, Mark. It is all just about ultimately all just uh, you know, 
care, caring for the athletes and their progress and um, yeah, d- different styles that, that work with different athletes and, you know, and, and then obviously what the, the coach's own makeup and, and what lends himself to it. So yeah. Um, yeah. Caring about the athletes. That's a, probably a, a, a good, good point on which to, uh, to end it. So. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks very much, gents. Um, really interesting stuff as always. Um, if anybody listening would like to uh, drop us a line and get in touch um, with any suggestions for future episodes, um, we are on Facebook. Just uh, search Track Coach Clubhouse and this will pop up. Um, if you're watching on the YouTube video, um, then you know, drop a comment in there. Um, also on Instagram, again, just at Track Coach Clubhouse or um, email trackcoachclubhouse at outlook.com. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.